Antibiotics in Society's online panel. Um, and this is the fourth in our online panel series, which have been um, very popular. And um, we're delighted to welcome you this close to the, uh, the holiday season. So thank you for joining us nonetheless, and a huge thank you to our panelists today. Um, before we get going, um, just a couple of bits of housekeeping. Um, the event is being recorded, and I think you'll all have just um, pressed a consent button for that. Um, and that means it's going to be available on the uh, Antimicrobes and Society website afterwards, where you can watch the previous sessions as well. Um, we're going to be using the Q&A function. So you'll see that there's a Q&A function and a chat function. Please only use the chat function if you've got some kind of technical problem. Um, we'll use the Q&A to post up questions to the panelists. Um, and, uh, and we will discuss those in the panel discussion. Although the discussion is primarily the focus of the, of the session is really about what kind of recommendations does social science research on antibiotics um, uh, offer us? So what, you know, what should we be doing about it? That's really gonna be the focus of the discussion today. Although there would be many other things I'm sure that would be interesting to discuss. Uh, we have a limited amount of time. So that will be how we will be focusing our discussion. Um, so as I say, these um, panels are intending to bring together the key insights from social research studies and particularly the, the insights in terms of recommendations. What should we be doing as a result of this um, enormous amount of really, really fascinating, high quality social research that has now been done uh, re related to antimicrobial resistance and antibiotics in particular. Um, and what, what does all of this research tell us? In our previous three panels, we've been looking at antibiotics in health facilities, antibiotics outside of health facilities, so in, in, um, in, in formal marketplaces and so on, um, antibiotics beyond humans, was our last panel and this time we're looking at antibiotics in terms of science, technology and infrastructures. Um, and so our panelists have been asked to describe something about their research and then think through a little bit with us what implications they think this has for us. Um, before we start that I'm just flagging up that this is the fourth and final of our social science um, orientated panels in the series, but we have a round table planned for the 24th of February, um, at which we will present, a, a, give a short summary um, of a report, which is pulling together the details from across these four different panels, particularly the recommendations that our speakers have made from their research. Um, and so we're summarizing that into a report, which will be shared with panelists who will be part of, or roundtable participants, who will be um, in two different discussions. The first one, um, considering the recommendations from social science research from a policy and programme perspective. And the second, the recommendations from uh, research from other researchers beyond the social sciences and research funders. Um, what do they think of the recommendations that seem to be emerging from the social science field? Um, so I really encourage you to, um, to ask your colleagues and, um, and contacts who work beyond social sciences to join us for that panel in February. And you can register on the antimicrobialsandsociety.org website for that. So back to today, um, we have our um, four panelists. We've got Nick Brown to start us off from the University of York. Um, then we'll have uh, Catherine Will from the University of Sussex. Uh, Kamatra Chinsatian Sup from the um, Sherindorn Anthropology Centre in Thailand and Charlotte Breeze from the University of Bordeaux. Um, and each of them has been um, producing just amazing, and this is just a little bit they'll be able to tell us about, but I strongly encourage you to look at the other work that each of these scholars has been um, putting out into the antimicrobial resistance field because it's just really, really inspiring. So I'm sure we're in for a treat from all of them today. Um, unfortunately, only 12 minutes though um, from each of them. So um, they will be sticking to that. Otherwise they're going to be told off um, to make sure that we do have time for discussion. Um, so we will have uh, the four, four uh, presentations back to back. If you've got I, you know, questions um, during the presentations, put them up on the Q&A uh, and then we'll have um, a roundtable discussion between our panelists. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go straight on to Nick. Please. Okay, thanks. I'll just try and share my screen. Right, you can see that, Claire? That looks that looks good. Um, and now it's full screen. Yes. Okay, that's good. I'm just going to give myself 12 minutes. So I'm going to use my phone for this. So I don't overrun. <laughs> Okay, we're off. So thanks to um, Claire and Rachel for organising the Amis Christmas party. Um, so it's great, great to see everybody. Um, so um, the, the brief for today that I really want to respond to is Claire's ideas about infrastructure and, and how that's developed in the, in the discussions around Amos. And what I wanted to do was to add to that by looking at evidently obvious infrastructures. So um, buildings and architectures and building design, but now seen as antibiotic uh, infrastructures. So what I'm going to do today stems from a number of projects that we have on, on AMR. The main project is this one, Park. So this is pathways, practices and architectures containing antimicrobial resistance and the cystic fibrosis uh, clinic. It was funded by the AHRC, part of their um, AMR program on the built environment. So we completed that project and field work at the very start of this year, 2020, just as COVID-19 was beginning to spread around the globe. Um, so this was a very detailed study of three uh, cystic fibrosis clinics and CF is a chronic um, life-threatening condition. It's characterized by persistently serious respiratory infections. Uh, these people spend much of their lives on antibiotics. Uh, so they have a very high bacterial load. Their lungs are heavily colonized with pathogens that can easily evolve um, and select for resistance through cross-infection between people with CF. So they have to spend a lot of their lives avoiding each other and going to sometimes extraordinary lengths to limit the chances of them meeting and cross-infecting. And yet they're of course all often brought together into uh, clinical hospital environments where social distancing is actually incredibly difficult as we're now beginning, uh, of course, to discover. Um, so, but this could also be all sorts of other kinds of contexts that are more common uh, kinds of infections and problems. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and other kinds of uh, conditions as well. But all of this has led us to think very critically about how, how antibiotics have made possible hospital buildings where distance uh, or the space of the body becomes um, less important. Um, so hospital buildings uh, that are necessarily conditioned by uh, antibiotics. And buildings where it's been less necessary uh, recently to pay much attention to the immediate atmosphere or, uh, or space of the body. So we're interested in what segregation means, uh, what social and material distancing means, materially, culturally and practically, uh, and the many tensions and the dilemmas that that raises for cystic fibrosis clinics. One aspect of the Park study was in-depth archival analysis of the hospital buildings where these cystic fibrosis clinics are located. So we had the opportunity to develop that historical angle through uh, a project to document healthcare building design from the pre-antibiotic into the antibiotic and into the potentially post-antibiotic. So we got funding from the Wellcome Trust Centre for Future Health uh, for an interactive exhibition to prompt healthcare stakeholders to think about building design and architecture. So what I want to do briefly here is take three architectural case studies, um, three architectural uh, imaginaries. Um, the first building that I want to talk about isn't actually a building at all. Um, instead, it's an idea for a building. It is an imaginary for a building. So this is the miniature hospital from the early 1930s, uh, currently on display at the new Wellcome Collection uh, at the Science Museum in London. So it's a model hospital um, put together by the Propaganda Committee of the King's Fund in the 1930s, conceived to be a pedagogic device to educate the public on what a state-of-the-art hospital might look like and to persuade patrons to invest in new hospital buildings. So it's on a scale of 1 16th of actual size. It's got an x-ray department, modern surgical facilities, got children's and adults floors. There's lifts between floors and so on. But it's also a lesson not just in high technology, uh, but in other aspects of architectural design too. 
Um, so you can peer into the wards and down corridors. Uh, there's this sense of spaciousness and volume. Uh, the building has relatively high ceilings. There's this emphasis on space and that goes right back to the Nightingale principles, which for the very first time apportions a set standardized volume of air for each patient. So that's 1500 cubic feet per patient and 100 square feet for each bed. So the building is also designed to maximize light with floor to ceiling glazing. So at one end of the building, there's the cylindrically shaped solarium um, or day rooms um, on each of the upper two floors of the hospital uh, with balconies that allow uh, for constant access to sunlight and fresh air. One of the things that's really interesting about this is the construction of the operating theatres. Uh, so these are the designers were very careful to include these externally fully glazed bays jutting out from the building. So in a sense, this projects the operating theatre out of the building and into the external environment. So the King's Fund uh, Miniature Hospital is a lesson in the immediate space and environment of the body. It's a design entirely premised upon the therapeutic and hygienic role of space and volume, ventilation and fresh air and sunlight. Now just um, across the hall um, at the same exhibition, you can see this, which dates from roughly almost exactly the same time as a miniature hospital. This is 1933 or so. And this is a model made by one of the tuberculosis patients at uh, Papworth Hospital just outside Cambridge. So the Papworth Village Settlement, as it was called, was founded in 1917 with incredibly utopian aspirations. So it was described in the Times in 1927 as, and I quote, the most successful socio-medical experiment of our times. So it's funny how um, in our work on cystic fibrosis, patients and clinical staff constantly refer back to these kinds of spaces, the fresh air wards and the fever hospitals. And architecturally, these kinds of spaces are part of a sort of historical imaginary um, of that persist and continue within the life, the, uh, the life of contemporary hospitals. Okay, so moving forward <clears throat> into, we might call it the antibiotic era. But my second case study is the hospital that's on my doorstep. So this is the, uh, this, um, is the, the hospital at York. Um, the Architectural Commission for York was awarded to John Weeks in 1967. It opened its doors in 1976. It's still going, it hasn't changed very much. Um, but it quickly gained a national reputation as one of the cheapest budget hospital buildings of its generation. But in part, that was achieved through savings made at the expense of volume and space. Um, it has fairly low ceilings. It has very tightly arranged ward bays, uh, very short walking distances for staff. Uh, the layout and the geometry of the building is extremely dense and contained. Now, like lots of uh, hospitals, it has a single main entrance, a public atrium. It's crowded with waiting areas and shops and cafes, a pharmacy, a welcome information desk and so on. So it's one of these deep density environments. The further you go into the building, the more likely it is that you enter into these windowless rooms and corridors. So as Robert Bird and others have pointed out, there's an argument to be made here about, you know, that what makes York possible uh, and hospitals like it is the availability of antibiotics, treating infections pharmacologically rather than environmentally. Okay, my final case study is this building. So you'll forgive me if you've heard me talk about this building before. The reason for that is that it's the only architectural commission that I know of um, designed specifically for a post-antibiotic era. So in take, talking about the post-antibiotic era, there's actually very few alternatives to talking about this building. It, it was commissioned uh, to the architect C.F. Muller uh, in the mid-2000s, uh, specifically designed to as a facility to replace the older infectious disease hospital at Malmo uh, in Sweden. So it's interesting for all sorts of reasons. First, um, unconventionally, it has this spherical cylindrical shape. It's a, a kind of series of discs layered one on top of the other. The architects set out to make the building semi-porous, um, having a hollow internal courtyard space and externally open floor to ceiling glazed panels that allow fresh air to circulate um, around a series of semi outdoor walkways. So walkways that encircle the whole building. 
the other key design feature here is that the building, the design lacks any single statement entrance uh, or lobby area. So instead patients and visitors enter into individual patient rooms directly from the outside, from these wraparound walkways. Now um, I've interviewed the architects and uh, spent lots of time at this hospital and interviewed the clinicians and um, the whole design process wrestled with some very difficult tensions. Uh, so there were tensions around patient privacy and yet the need also for visibility and connection, tensions around the potential isolation of patients in this, this hospital environment. Um, and there's been tensions also about uh, the management of ventilation systems too. So each of these individual isolation rooms have heavy airtight doors, you can see them there. Rooms can have positive or negative air pressure. That only works if these doors are sealed tight and closed. Um, but patients often actually like to prop these doors open. Um, so some patients want to hear what's going on outside in the city uh, or just have the breeze come into their treatment room. Okay, so I've been keen to think about some of this in um, relation to sort of biopolitical questions of immunity um, framed in part by these notions of immunitary architecture and immunitary design. So an example of that, of course, Sloterdijk has written very fittingly about uh, the biopolitics of architecture, a question of spherology and sphere building, he calls it, literally building architectures. So of course, who would have guessed um, a year ago that we'd start talking in the way that we do about bubbles and bubbling up. So this kind of colossal realization in the contemporary period of what Sloterdijk calls foam life or foam architectures, the tension between separability and yet the impossibility of separability. Okay, so um, we've um, developed this through a number of, of papers that are out at the moment. Um, uh, we've got a couple of papers out where we've been exploring these questions of architecture and design and antimicrobial resistance. So we've been interested in writing about AMR in the context of atmosphere and ventilation and air. Um, we brought out a paper on aspects of social distancing, uh, but in built environments where social distancing is extremely problematic, of course, as we're now realizing. Uh, and then there's also a paper on, um, I'll stop, the coughing body. So the socio-material containment of coughs and coughing. Okay, thanks, Claire. I'll um, just, um, share my screen and stop share thank you very much wow and spot on time fantastic um and really really interesting we'll go straight on to catherine and come back for our uh, discussion afterwards catherine are you able to share your screen okay is that working perfect excellent okay uh, put my time on. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk, this is the first time I've talked about this organism, so forgive me if it's not as neat and tidy as Nick, because I'm at the, I want to say beginning of a project, because it's been a very disrupted project so far. Um, it's an organism that we are coming across in our field work, in part through these cute and cuddly little creatures, um, which get taken around conferences and sexual health people are asked to hug them and be the face of the microbe. But um, we're also studying the sort of scientific work of different kinds that's done to understand this organism. Um, the organism, it looks pretty miserable there. It's, people call it fastidious, it means it's tricky to culture. And it was identified just about 40 years ago and it's still not settled in clinical practice at a global level. It's not clear, are they treating? How are they treating? Who are they treating? So um, yeah, the, the talk briefly explores those difficulties in the, in the short history of the science. So I'm gonna put up for comparison, um, a classic AMR history narrative, which comes from gonorrhea, which is I think much more familiar to most of us uh, in the AMR field as one of the classic kind of case studies of AMR developing. You don't need to read all the detail of this chart. It might appear a bit small, but I can just pull out a few key features that we think are important about this. So gonorrhea is an organism was identified in the late 19th century, uh, but this history starts in the 1930s with the first antimicrobial treatment. 
and human action is implied along the x-axis through new drugs and approaches to treatment. So you see antibiotics coming in, but being uh, superseded by one another as resistance emerges to particular ones. Um, there's a kind of international framing to it, so a sort of globalizing feel. So the organism itself is this funny uh, colored figure in the middle, um, but resistance is noted as appearing in specific regions. So it, it acknowledges the difference in different regions, but it makes it relevant to an organism that's seen as um, unitary across a, a sort of global picture. And then the twist that these authors give it is in the y-axis, where they give an account of the uh, reasons for this uh, history on the x-axis in terms of the genetics. So this is one of the things that's very important, I think, is the kind of use of genetic knowledge and investigations to understand uh, AMR resistance. And here that's, that's posed as a series of uh, mutations and events that are the kind of punctuation points uh, to this. But on, on the x-axis, the punctuation points are these moments when particular drugs uh, no longer are working. And as, as Nick and Scott Podolsky has sort of reminded us that each of those is a problem in the clinic, but a market opportunity. So a company's uh, endeavor to uh, respond to that issue. So I'm gonna shift now to my microplasma genitalium um, and just talk about how it's different and how different kinds of events are shaping the sort of messy life of this organism. So, one of the key things about uh, mycoplasma genitalium is it's really tiny and um, it means it's quite difficult to uh, identify. And many sexual health clinics uh, use microscopy to sort of check what's in a sample, but it can't be seen in that way. So around 1980, these new organisms were identified as being uh, possibly present in swabs from men who slept with other men who were presenting at the St. Mary's Hospital in London with a non-gonococcal urethritis. So they came with a symptom, samples were taken, and the clinician was, sure, was fairly sure that something was there, but wasn't sure what it was. And as I said, the organism was fastidious. He took it to Maryland where someone had, uh, the guy's name was Tully, had developed a new medium reminding us of Hannah Landica's work on the importance of the media for the possibilities of knowledge in this field. And in that media, these organisms grew, but slowly. <laughs> so uh, it took a month to grow them and um, it showed in vitro sensitivity to a range of antibiotics, tetracyclines, macrolids and fluoroquinolins, but not Fleming's penicillin, which had also of course originated at St. Mary's. And you can see the little plaque on the photo. Um, and the first thing that is very obvious about this, the sort of development of science around this is actually um, its importance in the field of genetics. So uh, Tully and Taylor Robinson start a program of work investigating this organism in subhuman primates and feel that they've demonstrated to their satisfaction that uh, Cox postulates are fulfilled and it's, you know, it's a, an infective organism. But in parallel, the new genetic science are, is interested in the organism because it's so tiny. So cultures don't matter in that field, um, but the size does. And it has the smallest genome size of all the mycoplasms. Uh, and it therefore is quite early uh, coded. Uh, its genome is completed. And um, subsequently it's used as the basis for a whole cell computational model. Okay, so that's sort of two parallel um, investigative uh, lines of science. Meanwhile, in the clinic, there's quite a lot of uncertainty. Um, and there were attempts between these two events, that moment of, of seeing it and uh, the whole cell model, which was published in uh, 2008, to understand its prevalence and effects from a clinical perspective. And as is very common in, in sexual health, this is done in a sort of geographical way. So new studies are proposed in different sites and locations, uh, global south and global north, and in particular populations. So I've just picked out two examples here. The first is a study of female sex workers in Kenya 
which found 16% of those women were infected. This was higher than the rates of chlamydia and gonorrhea, which of course are very common, uh, commonly treated in sexual health. And it was noted by the researchers that 25% of those infections persisted more than 12 months. Uh, same sort of time, the unit in the US, the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health found strong associations with vaginal intercourse and infections in a sort of unselected adolescent population. This led the researchers to presume it was sexually transmitted, but found that in most cases it was asymptomatic. So again, this is a sort of problem if you assume that it's going to make itself known to you in the clinic because people were coming in for this study and being found to be infected, but not reporting symptoms. So the lead author of that study said whether M. genitalium infected persons require or benefit from treatment, and if so, what antimicrobial therapy should re be recommended, remains undefined. And they noted that at the time that some open trials were under underway, but that in the US in particular, they were going to need randomized blinded trials for EBM purist guideline authors. And she thought to identify clinical need in deserving groups. And she spoke at length in the interview about needing to show that it was affecting women's fertility in order to get political momentum around the idea of treatment. Now, at just about this moment, researchers are then at discovering resistance. So I mentioned persistence of infection in the previous study. It's also becoming apparent that the infection is resistant to many antibiotics and the first ones that they've become most aware of are the macrolide antibiotics. So these are two studies in uh, European, Nordic and Australian populations, both of which observe this. And there was some debate about whether it was actually resistant at the moment of discovery but it was thought that it was probably just rapidly evolving resistance. And so a lot of our work has been trying to sort of plot the elaboration of those theories. And um, it turns out that azithromycin, a macrolide antibiotic, becomes pinned as the culprit. And the reason is um, widespread use in other infections. So first of all, respiratory tract infections, but mainly it starts to seem for other sexual health infections, including gonorrhea and chlamydia. And the investigations had a global scope, but the Nordic comparisons were made to do a lot of work. So my next two slides are about the importance of the Nordic experience in building this story. Uh, the first one is from a really interesting study done in Greenland with money from the NIH and a group of researchers from Canada, Denmark and Greenland. And um, in many ways, this was a quite an inspiring example of a study. It was highly participatory. It had community champions. It focused on education of young people and their understanding of sexual health. And I should say that uh, sexual health in Greenland has been uh, complicated for uh, many years. It has had high rates of gonorrhea, high rates of HIV, um, and early uh, age at first sexual experience. And those are all known in the community, uh, sexual health community that we research. Now the um, investigators reported that there was an ethical problem as they began, and that was that they weren't sure what to do about M genitalium. So M genitalium at the time couldn't be tested for on site in Greenland. Um, it, it, the only testing facilities were back in Denmark, so samples had to be sent back to Denmark, which you can see on the, the inset map is, is really a long way away. And uh, <coughs> they weren't sure whether longer term testing would be available and treatment would be offered. So there were many sort of uncertainties. Um, the study, however, uh, had a sort of deliberative approach to this and decided that the importance of knowing if M. genitalium was present outweighed uncertainty about long-term M. genitalium testing and treatment. So they did do the testing. And when they did it, they found high rates of this bacteria. So 12% of women were MGen positive. If you put men and women together, it was just under 10%. Compare that to the UK where community studies find 1.3%. So again, this was a, a population with high rates of this kind of um, uh, infection. And um, of those found to be, uh, to have the infection, uh, there was some investigation of their previous experience and it was found that 37 had been, 37% had been treated uh, with azithromycin in the previous three years. 
Uh, second example is comparing rates of resistance across the world. So in that study, Greenland has a macrolide resistance of 100%. Uh, things are resistant uh, to azithromycin. The important bit of information that was used by the researchers is the contrast between that and Sweden, which hadn't been using azithromycin and had a macrolide resistance rate of only 18%. And this is used then in the UK at least to narrate a need to shift guidelines. So new guidelines are published in 2018, which move away from azithromycin and gonorrhea treatment, switching from a dual therapy to monotherapy and call for MGen testing in patients with on gonococcal urethritis or pelvic inflammatory disease and a treatment of positive cases with doxycycline and a late dose of azithromycin rather than relying on azithromycin from the start. So there's a kind of interim settlement recommending testing and treating symptomatic people and their partners but not universal screening. More treatment is more resistance is the story. But the important thing here is that um, Many NHS clinics, even at this point, don't have good testing capacity or have lost it across the pandemic. Uh, very little access to resistance testing, though private clinics offer both. And I'm sorry, I'm going to race through the last slide. Um, at the same time, public health surveillance started and just about kept going. Uh, and um, again, observed that resistance testing was too slow for clinical use, but that it could be traced and that there was a research interest in exploring uh, the prevalence. The key thing about this, and I'm sorry, I think the slide's probably too small to read and I haven't got time to go through it, that the researchers are still finding it hard to disentangle persistent infection, resistant infection, and reinfection from the partner. Because if a partner is incompletely treated, then they can reinfect their sexual partner with what's effectively, in genetic terms, the same organism, and the things can't necessarily be dis distinguished. So this is a problem for the genetic approach. So MGen offers an alternative history, an intriguingly alternative history when compared to gonorrhea, which is much more familiar. It's an organism difficult to culture, to treat and to place in the sexual health field. There are different ways of thinking about populations, geographic, but also those at risk, sex workers and the like, and about the appropriate geographies for guidelines and protocols. In the field, the researchers have hopes for new antibiotics, but these currently are expensive and the trials involve risks and are difficult to do once something is established as normal practice. And this syndromic approach is struggling to disentangle resistance from other uh, features of the infection in the community, um, including a, a sort of uncertainty about how much these asymptomatic people might be fueling resistance by acting as a kind of reservoir. So I'll finish there, thank you. Super, thank you so much, Catherine. Oh, really, really fascinating. And a list of sources. Anybody who's yeah, coming which I can send out. will be able to pause that on the video to have a look. Yes, at. yes, and get a moment to look. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. We will go straight on uh, and save up the comments and please do put them into Q&A if you'd like to. Um, we will go straight on to Kamatra. Kamatra, are you able to share your screen? And unmute too. Okay, uh, my presentation will be about uh, uh, plant disease. And uh, in particular is a disease called citrus greening disease, which is uh, really, really damaging to the citrus industry across the world. So I will give you some of the outline of the paper. Uh, I will first provide some kind of introduction of the situation about the disease and what people try to do with it, which I call it the socio-technical tingling of care. And also some of the history about citrus disease in Thailand and what people in Thailand also trying to get uh, this disease under control. And by the end of the talk, I will provide some insights into how this socio-technical tingling also provide a view of looking at infrastructure as it is being made. 
So basically, uh, the use of antibiotic in citrus screening disease is actually not really much studied, partly because uh, other than medical use in human uh, concern of the antibiotic use are mostly in livestock and aquaculture. So plan basically is under look, or we can say we have some kind of plant blindness. And in this way, we are trying to also address this plant turn that try to look into what plant can tell us about uh, our understanding of antibiotic use. So particular, in particular in medical pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical anthropology, plants are mostly study with the focus on uh, ethnobotany or material medical of traditional society. So we try to look into this pharmaceutical uh, anthropology by looking at this modern human uh, situation about the use of antibiotic in plant. Uh, citrus disease, the history of it, it's uh, related really much to the history of citrus itself. So this is a basic outline of the history of orange as we know it. It was originated in Asia. Orange were domesticated 2000 BC and was also spread across the world through trade, especially in, in Europe and uh, later on in uh, America. And it has become one of the world most cultivated fruit tree in the world and have the industry about $5.4 trillion in 2018. But orange have all kinds of different varieties and uh, due to its ev uh, evolution, it also have very, very high ability to cross breed. It can mix, you can mix grafting stems with any kind of citrus roots, root stock. And this practice has become the method of choice for citrus farming across the world. And this also contribute a lot to the disease itself. So the disease which is called greening disease was actually first detected and known as Huang Long Ping in China back in 1919. And uh, it was first uh, thought that it was mycoplasma and theta cycrine also was tried, but then later on it's identified as uh, Candidatus uh, liberi vector asiaticus in 1928. And it was a foam restricted gram negative plant pathogen, which means they infected in the tube and make and obstruct the, the nutrient in the in the plant twig so it make the plant die and you can see from the picture that the color of the leaf would turn yellow and the disease was spread by this small little insect called uh, silit which also feed on the sap of the tree and when they got when this insect get into the infected tree and they also spread disease by uh, sucking and, and also releasing germs into other tree. And they also breed on other tree, this uh, picture of small little uh, uh, insects, small insect is where they breed and they change the color of the fruit and make disease spreading. And this is very, very damaging, especially in the US where uh, greening disease has slashed more than 70% of its orange juice production in a span of a decade. But as of now, there is no treatment, no specific treatment for the disease, but it has been spreading to all continents in more than 55 countries. So uh, when we look at this kind of uh, plant disease, we can also understand how we uh, try to, farmers try to control it 
and antibiotic has been used very, very early on in plant and animal. In, in animal, we know that after allowed Second World War, it, it's used to treat bovine mastitis. But in agriculture, there are also a lot of use, especially in apple and pears. When there is about 1940s, there are, there are all kind of fibroid disease spreading across the, the US and in Europe as well. So they're using antibiotic to control it. They tried out 40 antibiotics and finally figure out that streptomycin was the most effective. And you can see from the, the picture on the right side that there are all kind of technological in the invention to spray streptomycin onto apple tree. And because apple tree are high and huge at the time and gradually farmer control the tree to make it smaller and smaller so that hand picking apple, most apple in the world uh, need to be hand picked. So people are easier to, to, to reach and pick up apple. So the technology also evolved because we control the size of the tree as well. So, but the use of streptomycin in this time also make antibiotic resistant also appeared. So the detection of AMR in the use of streptomycin in apple orchard also prompted the restriction of its use by the US EPA. But aside from fibroid disease in apple, citrus also have its own disease, which is the greening, citrus greening disease. And because there is no, no treatment, uh, farmer began to experiment using all kind of technique of using antibiotic to control this disease, like spraying, dipping graft into antibiotic and see how it can suppress the symptom. Trunk injection was also found effective in Africa. And more studies also confirmed the effectiveness, but there is no systematic studies and, and the use of it is still very much regulated. But in less regulated country, it's widely used, such as in Thailand. The map show that all country in the world, 55 of them are all infected by this uh, greening disease, which is called Wang Longping in Chinese name. So uh, this slide show how socio-technical tingling happened. Right? They study into how a certain type of uh, halacidoid wasp can also help to eradicate the silic uh, uh, larva. So they promote the use of this insect to control some of the silver nanoparticle also apply to, to see if it's effective or they use transgenetic uh, grafting to make sure that certain type of graft would survive this disease or even using the streaming by uh, pushing hot air into the tent that make the temperature higher to, to see if uh, some of the plant, some of the citrus tree will survive and also using dog to sniff if there is any disease happening. So these are all kind of tinkling that's going on. As of now, we haven't got any specific treatment for this disease just yet. In Thailand as well, there are a lot of uh, uh, attempt to, to address this issue back in 1960 when it was first uh, detected. There is a, an expert from uh, FAO came to Thailand and worked to identify the disease but as he arrived in Thailand, 30,000 orange tree at Kamnanjun, which is a major orange orchard in the country was destroyed. His arrival is a bit too late and the, the, the orange orchard in the central part of Thailand were all destroyed. But at the same time, there's other part of the country which still uh, have uh, orange orchard and survive, especially in Bang Mot where uh, I will not have time to go to a lot of detail here, but 
here they are attempt to uh, promote certain kind of uh, like rust mite, rust mites to make the blemish peel of the orange, which considered the mark of tasty orange in in uh, here in in Bangmut, and it survived. But because of the climate. A flood, drought, and sea water intrusion, all these happen. And the, the Bangmut site also come to, came to an end. And people, farmer from the Bangmut uh, uh, area moved to the next part of Thailand, which is Langsit. And here some dramatic situation occur because there is a natural disaster, which, uh, which uh, the tropical storm era hit and flooded Langsit. And because of all three were mostly destroyed, the Goldman uh, distributed grafted stem to help the Goldman replant their orchard. But the qualified supplier were unable to keep up with the demand. So they are untested and contaminated graft from dubious sources were distributed. And this make the whole uh, uh, industry, citrus industry in Langsit also collapse. And people move from, from Langsit to Chiang Mai. And now Chiang Mai has become the largest site of the production. And after a while, there is also disease happening and nobody know how to treat it. But fortunately, there is this expert, which uh, the picture of the woman in the middle, uh, her name is Ampai Wan. He's a plant pathologist experimented on antibiotic for citrus screening disease and found it effective by injecting antibiotic into the trunk of the tree. He, she got the idea actually from Chwaf, which is experimented in Africa before. And he started to advocate it, but farmer was not able to use it. The problem of using antibiotic with the tree is that holes we, we, uh, for antibiotic to, to be effective, certain infrastructures is needed. Holes need to be drilled to inject drug. Power cable are needed. Laying power cable for each and every tree are costly, and there are no syringe strong enough to sustain pressure to push drug into the tree trunk. Then enter the cheap Chinese cordless drill. And this changed everything. People are able to drill without having power cable. And Farmer also tinker with plastic syringe. You can see from the image, the third image, that they are pushing additional volume of, of air drawn into the barrel and punch it. So to keep enough of the pressure in the barrel and the antibiotic solution, we're able to push into the tree without using any mechanical or electrical uh, device. And they use this a lot of syringe to push antibiotic into the tree. You can see from the picture above that all these syringe are used. And within one year, the syringe are out of stock in most, most part of Thailand. So the farmer also move on to create some interesting uh, tinker with this equipment. So they use ele ele elastic bands to apply sustained pressure on the syringe rather than using air. They found that soda bottle also can be used to make this pressure tank and air will pump into the bottles containing antibiotic solution to create sustained pressure light infusion kit and using the tube to connect the, the, the kit to the tree. They were able to save a lot of money on the syringe as well. So this have been practiced within uh, a few years and the citrus industry in Thailand has been recovering and expanding in recent years. So my argument is that the trunk injection is being replicated in other plants, like in coconut, in durian, in other palms as well, in Thailand and elsewhere, there are a lot of injection of the tree trunk happening. So we look at looking at this historical tra trajectory of citrus industry, help us to understand the assemblage of plants, pests, pathogens, pharmaceuticals and people, each with its own contingency trajectory, coming together and created precarious historical situation and the need for new operation. But infrastructure was not created based on preset operationality. Rather, it was we are socio 
technical tingling that created new possibility and enable alternate infrastructuralization to happen. Thank you. Sorry for taking a bit more time than allocated. You were absolutely fine. Thank you very much, Kamatra. That was fascinating. Gosh, we're going to have a good discussion after all this. Um, wonderful. We're going to go straight on to Charlotte. I will ask you to unmute. It's coming, I think. No, it's not coming anymore. Sorry, I just lost my file. I just have to find it now. Oh. OK. Um, can you see it? Not yet. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I don't understand what happened. There it is. It's yes. Uh, uh, OK, sorry for that. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Good morning. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Claire, for this invitation to participate to that uh, panel. Um, so I've been working since my thesis on the relationship between humans and microbes in the production and use of uh, knowledge. And for the past years, I have been in charge of a research project on phage therapy. And today, uh, what I would like to do is to briefly present this project, the approaches deployed, as well as some of the results uh, we have achieved. So uh, the initial objective of the project was to draw up uh, an overview of uh, phage therapy in France and Europe. So where is it practiced, by whom, how, who are the actors involved, and uh, to identify um, the issues and obstacles to its development. So what kind of scientific and technical knowledge and skills are needed, uh, what are the regulations, the infrastructures in place, what are the means of financing, etc. So the starting point for this project uh, was very uh, classical in STS. It was to start from the maturity of phages. So their skills, specificities, and characteristics, and to confront them with the logics underlying the development of biomedical innovation. So this project has been designed from uh, the start, from a um, uh, multidisciplinary uh, perspective. So the team is composed of two anthropologists, a philosopher, a lawyer, an economist, a researcher in viral evolution, but also doctors, microbiologists, and pharmacists, um, but I can't uh, cite uh, them. So there are uh, two uh, aspects in that uh, research. Uh, so we have first basic uh, questions in anthropology uh, regarding uh, the living, the ecology, multispecies relations, uh, but also a uh, basic question um, in STS and the standardization of the living, the administration of evidence, uh, the commensurability of biological entities, the production of drugs, etc. Uh, and so this is connected to uh, the second part of the work, uh, the use of these analyses. So they are, the two are entangled, but the use of these analyses uh, to promote a, a model that allows better access to phage therapy uh, through low production and sales costs, while at the same time trying to regulate its use as to try not to reproduce the errors uh, uh, of antibiotics. So uh, first thing first, uh, how uh, do phages uh, work? Uh, so here is a diagram of the two major types of uh, relationships that phages and bacteria can have. So the first step is that a phage will recognize a bacterium, it will attach itself to it, and this recognition, and this is really important, this, is re this recognition is highly specific. specific. Then the DNA we enter, will enter the bacteria, and here we have two uh, different solutions. Either the DNA of the phage integrates the DNA of the bacteria, and then we are dealing with a temperate phage that enters a lysogenic cycle. Uh, so this is the right-hand side uh, here of the diagram. And it is uh, perhaps the one that some of you are familiar with because temperate phages will play a major role in the acquisition of resistant genes by uh, bacteria. The second possibility is that the uh, phage is uh, using the bacterium's uh, cellular machinery to replicate and produce many copies of itself. Um, so this is the left-hand side of the diagram. So here the phage is said to be virulent, the cycle is said to be lytic uh, because it's le it leads to the lysis, so the destruction of the host bacteria 
releasing lots of new phages that will go to other bacteria. So we have a kind of self-maintained bacterial uh, lysis. So based on this uh, outline, I would like to show you briefly how the fundamental and applied uh, issues work together in uh, this project. So the work that I've been able to follow on phages and bacteria has allowed me to uh, develop the notion of pluribiosis. So I'm going to go uh, very quickly on this point because uh, it's just a question of giving you an idea of uh, what it's all about and how it connects to the question of the development uh, of uh, phage therapy. So if uh, we go back to the main diagram, um, what we can say is that uh, not only uh, are the relationships between entities not fixed, but that the entities themselves are transformed by the relationships they have with other entities. So when the temperate phage, for example, inserts its DNA uh, into that of the bacteria, the two entities are actually transformed uh, and the bacteria acquire new skills, but which skills uh, are they? It, is that the, are they the skills of bacteria or the ones of phages? So probiosis is a, a, a term, a practical term for the recognition of the spectrum of relationships between entities uh, that are themselves transformed by uh, these uh, relationships. So it's a term which allows us to presume neither relationships, uh, pro, anti, parasitic, mutualist, these kind of things, nor the future of the entities uh, in relation. So uh, actually, Pluribiosis speaks of the precariousness of the living, of the situated character of each entity and of each relationship. And therefore, uh, it calls for caution with regard to any solution that is intended to be massive and to any knowledge which won't be seen as a situated uh, knowledge. It is also a concept that allows us to account for the subtle approaches to human uh, microbe relationships found in infectiology which are actually very far from being redu uh, reduced to an eradication eradicationist approach, sorry, uh, stemming from a simplistic reading of germ theory. So if uh, we have to schematize, pluribiosis is exactly uh, what has not been thought of in the massive use of antibiotics. And this is what needs to be actively integrated into our reflections and developments, uh, scientific, clinical, regulatory, and economical on the use of uh, pages. So it is to this second part that I now turn. Uh, developing such, model, such a model involves understanding the whole chain uh, of uh, phage therapy. So from the isolation of new phages in the environment to their administration to the patient, uh, going through their purification, production, evaluation, by the setting up of uh, phagograms and by the insertion of uh, these therapy in uh, different care offers. Uh, so uh, we need to uh, document the different stages to understand the categories, approaches, and tools used for each uh, of these uh, stages. But we uh, also uh, need to take into account the overall context of the development of uh, this uh, therapy. And uh, indeed, this can only be uh, thought of in relation to antibiotic therapy, uh, of which uh, Clark Chandler has shown how they constitute a real infrastructure. And this infrastructure can also be considered as onto-epistemological, as we have shown with uh, Jessica Pujas. So antibiotics constitute a standard of what is considered to be a good uh, medicine, rough from uh, uh, an industrial point of view, so in terms of production, and from a clinical uh, point of view, uh, in terms of evaluating uh, its uh, efficacy. However, uh, phages are very, very, very different from uh, antibiotics, as we, you can see uh, very quickly in the, in the, in the table. Uh, but they are nevertheless assimilated to antibiotics, and they are considered in the regulations, but also in the, in the guidelines as antibiotics. And these have important consequences, both on the production of phages and on the way uh, these phages can be used. Uh, concerning production, I won't go into detail here. Uh, we described that in detail with Jessica, but one of the many questions that arise is how to standardize a dynamic and evolving entity. So phage therapy uh, poses many technical, scientific, and regulatory challenges, and all these uh, production processes are uh, very long and uh, costly. We have a second problem linked uh, to the question of production and of uh, uh, assessment of, uh, of efficacy, uh, regarding uh, so the, the, the evidence by our cities, because if uh, antibiotic resistance is increasing and represents a major public health uh, problem, it is 
for the moment, uh, essentially a problem in the making for, for the moment, but how, uh, for how long, that's the question. Antibiotics re retain a large part of their efficacy, which makes it very difficult, time consuming and costly to demonstrate the efficacy of phages according to current standards of EBM. So what we can see is that the current regulatory framework constitutes a first break on fresh and phage therapy and partly uh, explains the current lack of interest of pharmaceutical companies. Concerning uh, the use or the uses of phages, uh, two conceptions are opposed. We have what uh, is called a prêt à porter uh, model, which is based on the use of phage cocktails that mimic the uh, broad spectrum effects of antibiotics. So for example, you can have a cocktail which uh, will include several phages uh, active against different strains of staph, staph aureus. Uh, and in this way, the cocktails could be used on many patients with different strains, uh, which carry different strains of uh, uh, staph aureus. And then you have a, a so-called um, so sur-mesure uh, model, uh, which consists uh, in using phages showing a strong activity uh, on the bacteria. And so uh, the, the advantage of sur-mesure uh, approach over a pre approach is that it reduces the risk of resistance uh, appearing in a patient, but it also avoids, uh, the, avoids the risk of targeting non-pathogenic uh, bacteria, which is a very important problem with uh, antibiotics. But another risk uh, is emerging with the development of standardized cocktails, so with this pre uh, approach, namely the extension and massification of the use of phages to other fields, uh, for example, in uh, animal or environmental health, uh, with consequences that we are unable to predict at the moment. Uh, we can in no way actually predict the consequences of a massive release, release of phages into a given en environment. So uh, the vast majority of the actors met are in favor of a sur-mesure uh, approach. But as we have seen, uh, due to, to the high specificity of phages, such an approach requires uh, the setting up of large collections of phages uh, for each bacterial species, or at least for the escape uh, species. And we've seen that production within the current regulatory and material frameworks requires a lot of time and uh, money. And that's why uh, startups favor broad spectrum cocktails. The vast majority of stakeholders are also in favor of the concerted use of phages. But what we have to, to, to keep in mind is the weight of the antibiotic infrastructure and the weight of the current model of drug development based on the private sector and the search for cost effectiveness and uh, profit. So uh, if phage therapy is to be developed as a complement or alternative to antibiotics, without reproducing the problems associated with the massive use of antibiotics, it must be based on the development model that escapes the antibiotic infrastructure and takes full account of pluribiosis. We believe, uh, together with some of the actors with whom we uh, are actively collaborating, that an integrated model coupling production and use and based on the pooling of means and skills would make it possible to avoid massive use and therefore the risks of resistance and related ecosystem imbalance while at the same time ensuring a therapy at a cost that would allow the greatest number uh, to benefit from it. This model based on uh, public hospitals and on public research is currently being developed and will require regulatory changes, all things that we are uh, working on by now, but also, and this is really important, a willingness to support this movement by the public authorities. So I'm sorry this uh, uh, was a very quick and very broad uh, overview uh, that I proposed to you, but uh, if some of you are interested, are interested, I'm open to discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Super, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask if you can stop sharing your screen so we see yeah. our participants. That was fantastic. Um, and so I'm gonna ask if people want to put their questions um, up in the Q&A box. Everybody should be able to do that from the attendees. Um, and first, I think um, I'm going to run through as a discussant the, some of the themes that kind of emerged for me from across these panels before asking some questions um, from our different panelists to kind of um, initiate a discussion. And I think what everybody will see from these four just brilliant pieces of work just so I'm super super excited and I've already taken about 25 pages of notes just from today's discussion um, and that's not even with all of the the papers that you've been publishing around these topics I think what um, there's a number of things that become really 
you know, obvious from listening to these four quite different pieces, but collectively. And the first, of course, is the stories of science, um, how we have come to be where we are now, how the ideas and arguments that have been made by scientists and the threads that have been pulled together by research communities define where we are now. Um, and the controversies that in some cases we have heard are still palpable, um, but in others, the ways that those controversies have been obscured by um, effective, uh, much more effective dominant ways of seeing and doing that have then obscured some of those controversies and the value of the stories of science and being able to relay and revisit these stories of science and being able to render those visible again, um, more palpable so that we can um, you know, open up more options in terms of thinking about um, the, the future. Also, of course, what each of the presentations has demonstrated are the drives and priorities for scientific uh, research and, and inventions. Um, and across all the presentations, we've seen either directly or uh, through hints of this trajectory of a pre-antibiotic, an antibiotic era, and a post-antibiotic era, either in the present or in the future. Um, and I think Charlotte's presentation just now has really uh, underscored, and which we heard from each of the presentations, the ways that antibiotics have fitted in and reshaped a lot of things in the world. So that taking them out not only pulls other things that they're knotted into out, but that their replacement isn't possible to consider or to see until we're able to render visible what they pull with them. And in a way, how they have made the shapes of the holes that they leave when they become ineffective. So essentially that antibiotics, when they become ineffective and are are, um, you know, we see resistance, they're leaving behind these particular shapes of holes that we're expecting something like phage to fill, but it doesn't, so it then becomes invisible in a way to some, in some lenses, because we're ex the world has been shaped around the ways that antibiotics, we come to know those, um, and, and the way that we understand how they're effective, and so on, um, and the architectures of trials and all of that. Um, so here in this panel, I mean, when just sort of looking back between the three that came before it, in this one, we're not looking so much at the very immediate use of antibiotics by people, although that's part of this, these stories. But what we're really thinking about in terms of what, we're, what can be offered from across these panels is um, thinking about what is possible in the wider world, what are the, what are the medium term, longer term, um, you know, ways of thinking about our relationships with antibiotics, but also the ways that antibiotics have defined the world around them um, and, and how a, um, whether it's a post-antibiotic era or the way that we work with antibiotics becomes possible. So that's the first thing is these stories of science. Um, the second, I would say, is the stories of technologies. Um, and in each of these presentations, again, we're looking at um, how, um, these technologies are different technologies, including antibiotics as a technology, are knotted into different social production systems, um, economic moves, um, and as Kamatra calls it, this socio technical tinkering, the use of drills, elastic bands, syringes, plastic bottles, these other technologies that are part of these pictures that, um, that I think this kind of research really helps to render visible and helps us to see. And when we're thinking in a moment, we're going to ask the question, what does it mean for policies, programs and pilots? When we're thinking about that question, you know, rendering visible the way that this kind of research renders visible those, um, those different technologies alongside the ones that, that are promoted and are kind of made, made formal in the world and are part of that, those commodity chains. Um, and then another theme for me, aside from stories of science, stories of technology, is the stories of contradictions between principles and practice. So we heard in a number of the presentations this idea that meanwhile in practice um, is a phrase that we hear whether it's, you know, we've got a weighted door. Meanwhile in practice, we're going to prop it open. Um, and we've got um, 
you know, uh, uh, the use of uh, antibiotics supposed to be for humans. Meanwhile, in practice, we're having a go at, you know, putting them into other places. These syringes, then suddenly you have a, all the syringes in Thailand are stuck into, uh, into, uh, into trees instead of into people. And so this idea that the, the principles that are developed through a formalized process of science and technology in practice stand in tension. Um, and so um, this helps us to question what is expected to be normal in practice and the questions of blemished oranges and how we've constructed certain things to be normal. Um, the questions that Catherine raises around who is supposed to be treated, should we be, should we be screening? And if you screen and then you find a disease, should it be then be treated? Is it a diagnosis? Is it a screen? You know, with all of the questions that are still um, that are still out there, but the way that those questions are being formulated by the ways that we have previously used antibiotics. Antibiotics are supposed to do these things, um, then defines even the questions that the science is now asking and what and the ways that the controversy is formulated depends on that, that way that we have understood what antibiotics should be doing and the, the expectations that are built around those substances. So then, um, so those were kind of my three sort of themes that I was thinking about the science, the technology and the contradictions between principles and practice in terms of thinking across these. And then I was thinking, so, so how do we answer this question? What does it mean for policies, programmes and pilots? And um, I jotted down some of my own thoughts on that emerging from your presentations, but I'd be really keen to then see if we can have a discussion with the panelists about this. Um, the first I think is the, the nuance of the development of prevention and treatment programs um, and the way that it's often received wisdom that is somehow set that the way that we develop these prevention and trans treatment programs that antibiotics are a part of. Um, you know, and what I think this research from across these four presentations shows us is that the recognition that this is much more of an active, um, it's not set, it's a compromise and it's a working in practice set of principles. We're working with these principles and we're thinking with these principles, but they're less solid than is often imagined um, once when sort of we're teaching public health or when we're working in public health we tend to kind of take these as set entities, um, the principles of screening or the principles of where something should and shouldn't be used is taken as set in all that we can work with it. But at this moment where we have this huge challenge of antimicrobial resistance, there are a lot of things that then need to be opened back up and recognize that these are compromised terms, these are compromised principles that we're working with. And to revisit what those compromises were, I think the huge value of revisiting the science and the, the history of the science as each of these four presentations have done. Um, and so then I think another area um, that these presentations um, sort of broadly help us to do is to give us new ideas and concepts and language to think with. And I think that those, you know, the ideas to think with that emerge from these presentations as well as the previous ones in the panels, I think, uh, is, is, an, is actually a really important um, uh, intervention in the wider AMR world. And then um, the histories to present these different paths forward for AMR in general and the different ways that we have ended up using antibiotics which aren't set so that we can kind of rethink what those paths forward might be. Um, and on that note, replacing antibiotics will be insufficient until we recognize what antibiotics are beyond these specific pills and what their characteristics are in making particular ways of knowing. So antibiotics and the shape that uh, the antibiotics and this hole that is left when you remove them is shaped by our ways of knowing efficacy, our ways of, of testing, our, you know, the streptomycin trials that have now, you know, shaped so much else in the world about how we come to know the world. So the antibiotics themselves have had this role in creating this epistemology. Um, so that, you know, the, the efficacy, the testing, the supply chains, the implementation of antibiotic defines what it is that's possible to replace them now, but by revisiting them can allow us to expand those horizons of what is possible to change 
the shape of that hole that's left by antibiotics in a potential post-antibiotic era. So those are my thoughts of some of the things that I think that emerge in terms of what it means for policies, programs and pilots, that we're not necessarily expecting uh, these presentations to lead directly to. And, and therefore, the health workers just need to change what they're doing. Um, it's much more of a, uh, a challenge for the wider vision of what public health and science and research on AMR needs to be considering and the parameters that they're working within. Um, so those are my kind of thoughts and comments from across the four presentations. And I'm going to open up now to see whether um, you can all unmute, if you like, that might help. Um, and then see whether our panelists have some thoughts to add, having heard the other presentations um, or any provocations from my, my thoughts that I'm adding into the mix. Who would like to go first? Then I'll pick on you. I'm going to go back to Nick because he was first. So it's so long since you've now spoken. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, I, I don't really know how to top what you've said, Claire. I mean, you've you've managed to, you know, draw out some fantastic integration and distinctions and differences across the contributions for, from today. And, you know, thank you to all the other speakers for some fascinating stories. Um, I mean, I suppose one of the things that really stands out for me is, is uh, Charlotte's notion of pluribiosis, you know, thinking about, you know, I mean, in, the, in that specific case, the, the, the kind of transformational relationship between a phage and a bacteria, you know, thinking about that sort of immunitary relationship between those two entities at an extremely microcosmic kind of level. But actually, when, you know, you draw on that term and think, think about it in a much broader kind of macro infrastructural level in, in Charlotte's case, you know, thinking about phage research and of course, you know, the kind of probably the well known story now about the kind of macrological international global relationship between the Soviet um, phage research and, and the West in terms of antibiotics. It's a fascinating story. I mean, I, um, so I mean, actually, that's a, a, a wonderful concept to be able to take away from our discussion today. And it made me think very much about the, the work that we've been doing with buildings and with people who are ill with respiratory infections and the kinds of infections that they're sick with and then the relationship to the availability of antibiotics that have diminishing effectivity and you know there's a very concentrated story there of of the co-evolution of resistance between buildings people and antibiotics and these infections so that plurib but notion of pluribiosis, I think, is really interesting to think with, actually, about the relationship between the body and the building and the building of the body. Um, and um, so that's, I think, fascinating in all sorts of different kinds of, of levels. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, we've concentrated very much on, on the kind of on hospital environments as, as therapeutic kinds of environments having particular kinds of you know attributes and affordances and then the kinds of tinkering that goes on within these buildings to be able to um, prevent people cross infecting that kind of tinkering as Kamata, Kamata puts it but I think you know it's you know it's worth kind of stepping back just from that to kind of think about you know COVID and the way that it's transformed so many other things dimensions of life as well you know the workspaces and the kinds of environments in which work work goes on and and domestic environments you know kind of thinking thinking about antimicrobial resistance in the, in the domestic environment as well and the kinds of you no know, processes of plori, plori, pluribiosis that go on there too um in, in terms of my in terms of my own you know, listening to you and then thinking about my own interest in sort of architectures and buildings, it did make me think about, you know, I don't know whether Jamie Lorimer's, you know, you know, participating in the discussion today or, or watching, hello if you are, but you know, his work on kitchens makes me think, you know, very much about kitchens as, you know, sites of, of pluribiosis. And then um, also people like Richard Beckett, you know, talking about notions of bioreceptive de design, you know, the kind of the real rewilding and the re-ecologization of, of, um, of built environments um, in, in much more sort of, you know, potentially post-antibiotic kinds of, of ways. And his notion of bio bioreceptive design makes me focus on that notion of the receptive, you know, about 
being open to alternative imaginaries, op open to, to alternative ways of thinking uh, and exploring those through these, these processes of, of tinkering. That, that's my only response, really. Thank you. That's really, really helpful and rich and a really nice, um, yeah, one of the brilliant words that has come out um, the pluribiosis. I don't know, Charlotte, if you want to add anything. Um, uh, thank you very much, Nick, for, uh, for that. And I, I just want to add a, a funny thing, uh, because in, in the paper I, I wrote about pluribiosis, I, I explained where people uh, actually um, uh, isolate phages. And the best place to isolate phages is, is what is called rich waters. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the, the, the best place of one of the actors I worked with uh, is the waters in the um, canalizations uh, of hospitals, but not anywhere in the hospital, in very specific places in the hospitals and normally uh, in uh, infectious diseases units. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is, there is a, a strong connection actually with, uh, I think there is something very interesting here to connect with uh, between architecture of the buildings and uh, the way or where we can find uh, superbugs and also where we can find uh, phages and this kind of thing. So. Yes, I really like it. And also, uh, thank you very much because yes, the idea is, uh, is to, is, is, it was easy to demonstrate it for me by talking about phages and bacteria, because yes, you can see really uh, the, the transformative potential of, of viruses. And it is true also with COVID, uh, it's totally true. And uh, the idea with uh, this, this notion of pluribiosis was to say that it was, I think at some point operational at some scale, uh, but uh, for all living things, but we have to do uh, each time to, to define why is it uh, pertinent or not to use it. But um, yeah, so f thank you uh, very much, uh, Nick. Catherine, would you like to add anything at this point? Um, I, no, I really enjoyed all the papers. I thought they worked very well together and you did a good job of pulling out some connections for, between the different stories. Um, Nick's paper, I really enjoyed the, the history of it and the way that you take us to prebiotic, pre-antibiotic hospitals. As we're working on a community-based medicine, which actually was put back into public health and into city council commissioning. So it's even further from the hospital than it used to be. And so there's a weird split between imagined futures of point of care testing and very, very rigorous targeting of the right antibiotic for the right bug and the sort of narrow spectrum prescribing. And then the reality of it is so far away from that in many cases. Um, and you see in the pandemic, there's this weird explosion of laboratory capacity all over the world, yeah. but it's not actually available for that kind of testing. So all the clinics are telling us that they're fighting to get even their ordinary samples done in any kind of time and um, that that's getting very difficult. So this sort of weird split between a technical fix, which will require laboratory capacity and the practical reality of that laboratory capacity not currently being available for sexual health. There's of course a question of what happens to that laboratory capacity if and when we get some sort of handle on COVID. But right now, you know, it's very, very difficult to get those testings. And that meanwhile, the private companies are offering testing rapidly at some cost um, and sort of effectively competing with the NHS, but they're also generating knowledge that people don't really know what to do with. Like, yes, it's a positive MGen result, but we don't normally treat that. We don't want to treat for that because you're not symptomatic. So this sort of really complicated political space. And as Charlotte and I are both interested in, I think the way that the RCT model doesn't fit this space very well at all as uh, so the regulatory pipeline for new treatments is assuming an RCT approach that is very difficult to implement in the case of AMR and I think has to be challenged just but maybe with COVID it's it's been imagined as potentially uh, challengeable or revisable because there was this speeding up of things but we'll see yeah oh, that's really interesting thanks Kamatra, I'm going to ask you to, there's a couple of questions that came in from the chat that were relevant to um, your presentation. Um, and um, one was the uncontrolled use of antibiotics in crop plants. Um, can this lead to a future problem in trading? 
Um, and I suppose that would that would require that there are trading standards that require you to test the antibiotic residue levels of your your oranges, and that's probably um, a little way off since we still haven't quite managed it in fish, as far as I understand. Um, and let's not talk about fish today. Um, so um, there was another question relevant to you, uh, Kamatra, which was about, I was particularly struck about the relationship, and this is from Roger Harrison, um, particularly struck about the relationship then with other priorities affecting our planet, the amount of plastic that's part of the tinkering was astonishing, highlighting the, the clash of priorities. And plastic has been a big thing in Thailand. So would you like to, would you like to uh, comment on that, Kamatra? You are muted. For the possible problem in trading, I think it's still pretty uh, not within the concern, partly because th the test for antibiotic residues in all these orange always find it negative. There is no residue in the fruit. And uh, in the US, there is also the use of antibiotic and the, U, U, the U.S. is actually the biggest producer of orange juice. So I don't know, still haven't heard anything about international uh, negotiation uh, based on this antibiotic residues in, in orange or other crops. But for the plastic, I think that is part of the, the tinkering process. You know, you, you work with what you have and uh, you know, just try to go by with you know, any possibility that would save the orchards, which cost millions of dollars, millions of baht for local people. So they would go all the way to get it done somehow. Even if there is no guarantee, if you use antibiotic, this is going to work, but they try it anyway. But because they try it because of this tinkering process, they could navigate into the tree tree that possibly provide new possibilities how local farmers can survive. Thanks, Kamacha. Um, and I'm really sorry that I'm going to have to draw our discussion to a close because we are almost at the top of the hour. I can't quite believe the time has flown so wonderfully by. I've really enjoyed the, um, the discussions with everyone. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope everybody else from their different uh, yeah. login locations has enjoyed it too. I'm going to just put up um, my slides again. Uh, let me see if I can, I'm sharing, how do I make it? There we go. Um, so here are, uh, so this is again, just to remind people to register for the event in February. Um, and here we are, it's not too late to contribute to the report that we're putting together. So. Um, primarily, we're uh, drawing on some of the themes that have emerged from these four panels, but we have room to include other people's research. There's obviously more than 16 people working in this field, which is what we've managed to cover um, in these panels. So um, please do um, send it. We thought the easiest way, we've tried to make this easy for people, everybody needs something to be easy these days. Um, the easiest way is to follow this survey link, which is coming up magically right now from Rachel in the chat. There it is. Um, and if you are on, uh, on our mailing list from Amos, you will have received this through our latest newsletter. If you're not, go to the website, join the newsletter, then you will find out about all these wonderful publications people are, are putting through. Um, so finally, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists from today, but also from the other three panels um, and to Helen for helping us chair and to help us curate this um, series. We look forward to seeing you all in February for our February event, where we hope that some of the things that you've all been putting forward will be able to be taken up by a wider set of stakeholders, for want of a better word. Um, and so finally, just to say thank you very much to the panel today, to everybody else. Um, it's been fantastic, really, really inspiring. And I hope you all have a safe and happy holidays. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you.